Law professor Jonathan Adler explains the Supreme Court's new ghost gun case and how it connects to the bump stock case. That and more on this episode of the Weekly Reload Podcast. All right. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of the Weekly Reload Podcast. I'm your host, Stephen Gutowski. I'm also a CNN contributor and the founder of TheReload.com, where we're actually having a sale right now, a third anniversary sale on memberships. So you can get 20% off your first year if you head over and sign up today for a, a membership, which will give you exclusive access to hundreds of pieces of news analysis you will not find anywhere else. You'll also get this podcast day early and the opportunity to appear on the show if you would like to do that. I think we'll have uh, some more member segments coming up soon. But this week, we are focused on the Supreme Court and its latest gun case, or gun-related case, at least, uh, which is why we have uh, law professor Jonathan Adler with us from uh, Case Western Reserve University, who is joining the show. He's a Supreme Court expert, uh, somebody who's written a lot about uh, all of a number of these gun cases that the court has taken up. And uh, uh Welcome to the show, Jonathan. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Good to be here. Yes. Can you tell people just a little bit more about your background and, and who you are? Sure. So um, uh, as mentioned, I'm a law professor here at the Case Western Reserve University School of Law in Cleveland. Um, I should say I'm the Johann Verheim Memorial Professor of Law. Um, I focus on constitutional law, administrative law, and environmental law. A lot of issues relating to guns uh, these days involve both constitutional law and administrative law, constitutional law on the Second Amendment side, um, sometimes the due process side on the uh, administrative law side of things. How do we interpret statutes? How do we know what agencies are allowed to do, not allowed to do? I do a lot of work in that space. And then I do some work on judicial behavior. Um, and in, I edited a, a book on the Supreme Court. Um, and observing its behavior in the Roberts Court and do a, a fair amount on that. Um, I'm one of those folks that's always tallying up how many cases have been argued and how many have been decided and who's written what so we can pretend like we can predict who's going to write what decisions. Um, <laughs> and, yeah. um, you know, in terms of evaluating how, um, uh, in particular, the Trump nominees uh, and, and most specifically the replacement of Justices Kennedy and Ginsburg with Justices Kavanaugh and Barrett affects the court's jurisprudence. Um, you know, that's a question that I and a, and a bunch of others spend some time trying to figure out. And certainly in areas both related to administrative law and it looks like um, gun law in particular, um, that it, we're going to see a shift um, yeah. and are, are in the midst of seeing a shift. And so cases like this and, and some of the other ones on the court's docket are important. Yes. Yeah, so you are a, a an expert in this topic. You also write, of course, at uh, National Review, The Vol Conspiracy as well. Yes. So yes. Vol Conspiracy um, hosted at Reason.com, an independent, yes. often, although not always, libertarian um, legal blog um, that uh, used to be at The Washington Post. Uh, but they wanted to put us behind their paywall. And we did not want people to have to pay to read us. So we left and Reason offered um, to to host the site without exercising any editorial control. So um, we we said that yes. A, and so nice we've arrangement. Been at yes. ever since. Good resource for those looking for, like you said, libertarian leaning uh, analysis from uh, a number of law experts. Several of them we've had on the show before. Yep. Um, I, have, I have quite David a few Kobel. very gun gun focused uh, uh, co bloggers. Um, Eugene yes. Bollock, who who oversees the blog, David Kopel, um, you know, both very interested in, in gun related mm -hmm. issues. Brandon and Warren very influential and in the, uh, especially in the legal field on, yeah. on the second amendment. We haven't had Eugene Bollock on yet, so we'll have to have. You should. Sure? He's done, to come on. um, he's done some very interesting work on the history of gun control and, and, and the second amendment. And, um, yeah. So, and, yep. and then my colleague, Josh Blackman, I know uh, who co-blogs there as well has done mm -hmm. some stuff on. Yes. He's, he's given us comment before in the past for stories, but this, this, uh, like you mentioned, there's a, seems to be the court is very interested in administrative law, specifically, uh, gun law or administrative law to related to guns, the ATF. Uh, and so they've taken up this new case on what, you know, colloquially people would call the, Biden ghost gun ban. Um, if you want to be a bit more technical, it's actually 
a, a regulation on the sale of unfinished for firearm right. frames and receivers. And um, recently we had uh, the fifth, uh, court in the Fifth Circuit, a district court uh, ruled that this law was, or this rule, sorry, was uh, violated the law because it expanded the ATF's power beyond what is allowed under the statute. And so it violated the Administrative Procedures Act. And um, the, uh, the three-judge panel in the Fifth Circuit uh, agreed with the lower court. And now the government has appealed this to the Supreme Court, and they've agreed to take it up. Can you just give us a little bit of a uh, breakdown on, on what where this case stands and what it means for the Supreme Court to take it up? Sure. So, um, I mean, two things. Initially, um, uh, when the district court had found that the regulation um, redefining or expanding the definition of um, firearms and a frame and receiver, and those are, you know, we'll get into, I'm sure, it did both of those things. And um, legally, the what the court, what the ATF did with each is is, is distinct, um, uh, perhaps in a meaningful way. Um, district court enjoined the rule as a whole. The Fifth Circuit um, uh, narrowed that sum. Um, there's a big question in a lot of these cases about when uh, an agency issues a regulation that has a problem and there's and a court finds a problem with it. Do you invalidate the entire regulation or you just invalidate the parts that were challenged and that are a problem? There's a second question about um, to what extent do you provide relief be beyond the parties to the case? Uh, and these are issues that the court has been dealing with quite a bit of late. Um, initially, the, the federal government went to the Supreme Court asking for a stay of the injunction, you know, so allow the regulation to go into force while the litigation proceeds. The court right, because the lower courts didn't, denied that, right? right. They, they said, no, yeah. you're not getting a stay. Yeah. This is being and, vacated completely for everyone. Right. That was the first step here. And the, then they went to the Supreme Court. Right. They went to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court took a little bit of time to decide on that, ultimately uh, granted it. Um, but four justices, uh, Thomas, uh, Gorsuch, Kavanaugh and Alito, indicated that they would not have granted that um, temporary relief, mm -hmm. um, which, um, you know, suggests either that they're skeptical of the government's arguments or perhaps that um, insofar as the Fifth Circuit narrowed um, the injunction to some extent that 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 dealt with what the court should be concerned with for now. But I think the former is more likely. So a hint, at least, that four justices are skeptical. Um, uh, this The Justice Department asked the Supreme Court to hear the case, um, uh, filed a petition. Well, didn't it go through two? There were like two rounds here because there was the, the initial phase yeah. where they issued that, that stay where they had the noted dissents. Uh, and that was just on what the um, on that broader uh, expanded view of how, of you know vacation of the rule and applying to everyone. Uh, then then it went back to the Fifth Circuit panel and and they, I think, well then it went all the way back to the district court. He wasn't there a decision on the merits. Yeah. At that so point? Uh, right. So it went back. They they, so they kind of did this whole merits. thing over again. Um, Fifth Circuit affirmed in part and vacated in part. And right. And, That's when that Fifth Circuit tried to narrow yeah. the 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 ruling a bit. Right. And but, now the court as as a great the court still already, wasn't happy with that. Right? No. <laughs> right. And and you know what's interesting is that you know the the court has only taken four cases for next term. Um, the mm. court takes. You know, what's interesting, I mean, just to step back for a second, um, you know, after uh, District of Columbia versus Heller um, and the, the court's invalidation of the DC, the District of Columbia's prohibition on having a functional firearm in the home, um, the court didn't, wasn't in a rush to hear more cases. It, initially, it heard, it heard <laughs> yeah. a, a case called McDonald versus Chicago, which expanded, uh, applied that same right to the states, which was really a no brainer, although it was a 5-4 uh, in fact, I would argue as a constitutional matter, um, the outcome in McDonald's was, you know, more for, uh, foreordained than than even in D.C. versus Heller, because there's very little question that um, uh, the 14th Amendment under when it was when the 14th Amendment was adopted, that one of the privileges or immunities of citizenship that it was protecting uh, was the right of free citizens to protect themselves um, and that it was understood at the time that um, free black people would be able to protect themselves with weapons um, and um, that that was, um, you know, very much on the minds of those who drafted and supported the 14th Amendment. Uh, and that applies as against the states where 
only the Second Amendment applies as against the federal government. After that, the court didn't hear a lot of cases uh, about the Second Amendment. And that's been uh, up until Bruin. And that's really been interesting that, you know, you've had you've had lots of litigation over guns, both constitutionally and increasingly in, in the administrative law context. And the court really had been avoiding them. There was this one silly case out of Massachusetts involving, I guess, stun guns, where the court Satana. vacated and sent it back and just said, you know, it was basically, you didn't apply the right test. We're saying nothing else about what you did, but at least apply the right test. Um, yeah, and, which was about the, I mean, Massachusetts had said stun guns aren't protected by the Second Amendment because they aren't, they didn't exist. Right, in the founding right, which is just goofy, court. right? Um, yeah. And and clearly, I mean, as an academic or, you know, as, as a professor that grades students, it's like you answered the question without having done the reading. I mean, was was essentially what the court was saying to the Supreme Right, to this and that was a 9-0 um, ruling. But what's interesting is, you know, now as the court's done, you know, the court had been avoiding gun cases. The court overall is taking far fewer cases. So it's only heard argument in 61 cases this term. That's the smallest in years. Um, you know, when I started um, uh, as a professor, the court would routinely hear over 100. You know, you go back to the 80s, there, there are terms where it heard like, you know, 150, 160 cases of term, only hearing 61. Um, and yet, we have this explosion of gun cases, right? We have Bruin from just a couple of years ago. This term, we have the bump stock case and we have Rahimi. So both an administrative law case and a constitutional case involving guns. And then the court has thus far only accepted four cases for next term so far. Um, that's way behind what we would normally expect. And of those four, one of them is another administrative law related gun case, a gun case which, as we'll get into, I assume, could be affected by what the court does um, in the bump stock case in terms of what the court says about how to interpret the language in statutes relating to guns, and right. also could be affected by what the court does um, in, in a case called, uh, well, a pair of cases called Relentless and Loper Bright, which deal with something called the Chevron Doctrine, which is a, a rule about how courts review agency interpretations of statutes. And that could affect this case too. So. It's yeah. it's plausible to me that this court case ultimately gets remanded in light of what's done in these other cases. So it's really? just interesting that the court is, while it's hearing so much less, it's devoting more time to gun related questions than it has in a long time. And the assumption has, I mean, the natural assumption is that has something to do with the change in the court's composition in the last few years. That it's now willing to say, look, we've we've got to deal with these cases because they're coming up, they're being argued in the lower courts, people are being prosecuted, people are filing these challenges. We need certainty and we need consistency uh, across uh, across the federal system. And so we're getting a lot of attention to guns in, in given how little the court's doing. That That is very interesting for, for several reasons to me. Um, one, it's interesting to see uh, that you're connecting these administrative law cases that have to do with the ATF and guns with the second amendment uh cases because you know obviously they're not the right. same uh you know they're not the same legal claims there's right. no second amendment claim in the in this case that they've taken up there are second amendment claims against this rule right but not an issue in this case um so it's interesting that you see these as, as connected as a sort of a larger uh effort by the court to focus more on the second amendment um it's interesting for a second reason because I mean, that that was uh, a complaint you heard from the conservative members of the court for years. Like Thomas uh, and Alito, had, had, it was Thomas and, and Gorsuch, I believe it was, wrote uh, dissents when they. Uh, I mean, Thomas consistently and sometimes others. I yeah, mean, Thomas did it all the yeah, time. But it, it, was a, it was a complaint from him. It was a complaint from certainly from gun rights advocates. It was also oh, sure. a complaint from folks who just believe that one of the most important things, if not the most important thing the Supreme Court does, is ensure consistency in, in the application of federal law throughout the country. Mm -hmm. And after Heller and McDonald, there was a lot of uncertainty about what, the, what they meant for a wide range of gun regulations, particularly yeah. in those states that have more aggressive or more stringent gun regulations. The case they ultimately take Bruin, um, I would argue, should have been a no-brainer. That is to say, um, you know, Heller and McDonald dealt with fairly extreme laws concerning guns in the home. Bruin, you know, added, added, 
the New York law there was was as about as broad as you could get for a, a law affecting carry in that um, it basically said, you know, a government official gets to decide whether you have a good reason, which given the history of, of firearm regulation, particularly in the wake of the Civil War, you know, clearly has to be out of bounds. Um, and then the court gives this test in Bruin, which lower courts have been have been struggling with. And so you have the, you have the need for more certainty there. You also simultaneously have um, federal agencies trying, the ATF in particular, trying to do more to um, you know, update or clarify the way existing laws and regulations apply to firearms at a time when Congress is not doing that. Um, and you know, so whether they're connected, you know, whether the justices say, oh, you know, these are connected because they all involve guns or it's just two paths that happen to be, you know, kind of reaching the court at the same time, they have to be aware that the percentage of the, you know, the share of their docket, the share of their time that is being spent on gun related questions is increasing. And, you know, then there are also a whole bunch of gun gun adjacent things that the court is dealing with, deals with regularly, like application of the Armed Career Criminal Act, or um, you know, there's a First Amendment case this term that that um, involving the NRA. So, I mean, there are other kind of gun adjacent things, but it it is, um, you know, while I would hope the justices think about cases first and foremost in terms of their legal, the legal questions they raise and not the context in which those questions arise, when you're doing so little and, so, and, and a, a growing share of it relates to a certain subject matter, um, the justices have to be aware of it, whether it's deliberate or not. And mm. it, and it's certainly going to affect the way the court is perceived, right? I mean, if the court deals sure. with 100 cases a year and two of them deal with guns, okay, if it deals with 50 cases a year and four of them deal with guns, well, then, you know, the the association of the court and, and gun law and policy is going to be greater. And you know, that's just that's a descriptive a, fact, whether the court is doing it deliberately or not, in terms yeah, of the politics that, when we think about the court. That's, that's a that's true. a good a good point. Yeah, but I, you know, because I've been I, the way I've been looking at these cases is pretty separate in my in my view in my mind. Just because, uh, so it's interesting to hear you um, connect them like this. Because I mean, I, obviously there is that base level. Just they're about guns, so they're connected. Right. Um, but I, you know, I've looked at a lot of these cases stemming from these uh, executive uh, branch or, you know, executive agency rules and changes made there as much more in line with how the court is trying to approach administrative uh, policy and trying to, it seems like part of what they're doing of late is trying to rein in the administrative state. Like they're I trying think to rein so, in but these you, agencies. It is and interesting. I've looked at it as uh, connected to more to that than the, the, their I mean, second yes and amendment no, and this well, and yes, if the goal is just to deal with the administrative law question, um, the court does have some degree of choice about which cases it takes, right? Um, mm -hmm. um, the case it took on the Chevron Doctrine, which a lot of people have focused on, is about fishing. Um, and, you know, whether or not fishing boats have to pay for the the people that are observing, you know, for the observers that are making sure they're, they're violating the rules and whether the agency could impose that. Um, you know, the... Um, uh, I suspect that at least some of the justices, that is the justices that are more concerned about the court's you know, kind of political capital or about about the way it's perceived. So Chief Justice, so perhaps. John Roberts. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, um, would prefer to deal with the administrative law questions in very kind of sleepy, arcane, technical mm. areas of the law and yeah. where the... Um, the, the party that's being burdened is sympathetic. So, you know, so there, there are a bunch of areas, examples of administrative law questions that come up with some frequency where the court has avoided hearing those questions when it's like General Electric or Exxon, but rushes to take it when it's, you know, M Michael and Chantel Sackett, who are small property owners, or perhaps when it's brought by a state. Um, um, and um, you know, what's interesting, it, certainly in, in the bump stock litigation, what's interesting is that the way that case arose and the way um, the the government adopted its its new interpretation of the law that it said wasn't a new interpretation or the, the newly discovered meaning of the law that hadn't changed um, kind of did present an administrative law question in a way that was hard for the court to avoid. And there were enough of those cases and there was a clear circuit split. The court kind of had to take the bump stock case, um, in my view. Um, 
you know, but you I, don't think I, the same is true for this case, well, the uh, unfinished frames and receivers case. The cert petition, you know, the cert petition that the federal government filed purely put it in terms of, look, you, you know, this is this regulation was invalidated, reviewed on that basis, not on the basis of different courts had done different things. So in the bump stock case, the court waited until different federal appeals courts had reached conflicting opinions, and then it kind of felt it had to. I, and that, that's certainly my reason. Yeah, it did wait a long time. Yeah, it, 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 it was waited years. a long time. Well and, after the, the confiscation deadline came and went. Too. Right. And and I think, you know, one one interpretation of that is the court likes to not have to decide things. And, you know, with the with the bump stock, uh, as you know, and as listeners, I'm sure know, um, you know, one question was always, well, why doesn't Congress just do this? And it 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 certainly appeared initially the votes were there to do to impose some sort of limitation on bump stocks um, mm -hmm. after after what happened in Las Vegas. And um, the Trump administration just chose not to do that. And um, yeah, you know, I think this was the pressure relief valve solution right. of going uh, rulemaking instead of lawmaking, right, especially because the sort of unintended consequences of lawmaking, I right. think, was viewed as the, the risk. At the sure. Time. But the, the 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 flip side of that is the court, I think, was view of like, well, maybe if we don't take this, maybe Congress will eventually do it because then it's an easier question, right? Then it's what did Congress enact? Is there a Second Amendment issue? Um, you know, right. I, 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 um, you know, without seeing Rahimi, without knowing what the court's going to do there, you know, if I were um, looking to um, uh, bolster the the protective the, the gun rights protectiveness of the court's uh, Second Amendment jurisprudence, bump stocks would not be at the top of my list of things to bring before the court. Mm. Um, uh, and so, you know, the court would have had time to, uh, deal with a range of other second amendment cases before having to think about bomb stocks had Congress acted, Congress didn't, the court's now stuck with it and it will decide that here. Um, you know, I, I, I suspect that the five justices that voted for the stay did so in part because they believed the question in, um, in the Vanderstock case in the case involving, um, um, what people refer to as ghost guns, but, you know, obviously we're, we're privately made firearms or fri privately made firearms and um, parts of firearms or, or, you know, frames, receivers, et cetera. I, I suspect that the five that voted for the, to stay on lower court injunction did so in part on a belief that um, the case was cert worthy and that the federal government had a reasonable likelihood of success on the merits there is some debate right now in the really? court over well there's a debate right now in the court over what the proper standard is for providing that sort of relief um at the supreme court level on what people refer to as the shadow docket although it's really just the motions docket or but um and um we've seen in in recent weeks we've seen some opinions from justices raising um uh, the question of to what extent should a view of the merits influence that choice and should what extent should a view of the cert worthiness of the case influence that choice um pretty clearly the cert worthiness plays a role and i'm oversimplifying this a, a bit but the idea being that if it's likely that this is a case that the court would hear and the court generally likes to keep the status quo in place while it's hearing a case then a stay is justified to preserve the status quo while the case kind of makes its way to the court um yeah yeah the, i mean that's how i've traditionally heard people yeah and there is though this. this question about you know if if you know, when, when when the court issues a stay or some sort of injunctive relief um especially on some sort of preliminary basis there is this idea that we're concerned about the effect on the parties in the interim of either giving or not giving that relief and if you have a good reason to believe that one party is going to ultimately win um you are and again, I'm oversimplifying this, but you are more concerned about the um, the inequity of, of harm that could happen to their interests in the meantime. Right. So the more likely you are to think that the government will be able to defend its regulation, the more likely you are to uh, allow that regulation to go into force while the litigation is pending. And again, there's that, some debate about whether how much of a role that should play in the analysis and um, there was there were some opinions about a week or so ago involving a, a an Idaho statute, a totally different topic relating to gender affirming care for minors. And uh, but where the justices 
laid out the extent to which these things should should matter. Um, so a long way of saying you come into this case pretty confident four justices are skeptical of the government, reason to believe that four or five might actually be sympathetic given that the state was issued, but mm. we're not entirely sure That's, because they don't explain the state, right? The state's a one line. Yeah, there, there was no explanation right. other than, I mean, I, I think they don't have to explain when a justice has voted against granting a stay, right? No, I have uh, to say anything. In that no, I mean, we, if a stay is granted, we know five had to vote for that. Five have to vote for it, but they don't have to say that they didn't vote for it. You know they don't. I mean? They don't have to tell us anything. Right. In this, so that's case, why. That's why know. when I when I look at this case, and this is where I, maybe we disagree a little bit about how the the sort of tea leaf reading, and I know that's uh, always a risky thing to do with the Supreme Court, um, even even after they've had oral arguments, right? But um, you know, when I look at the this case and the Supreme Court's intervention in it, um, it says more to me that they had those four come out. Now you watch this closer than I do, so I'm interested yeah, I mean, in why we might disagree here. But, but they that says four are almost certainly not going to vote with the government uh, on this case, and so you have the remaining five. Three of them are the liberal justices, who, sure. frankly, you can probably just chalk up to vote against any sort of pro-gun litigant. In almost any case, I, maybe that's a bit too well, I mean, unfair three or generalized. That, that are both hostile to firearms and very sympathetic to regulatory. I mean, Jackson agencies. doesn't have a, a long track record yet, but how she's performed in oral arguments doesn't, you know, in Rahimi and. But they're the sympathetic to case. the federal government generally. They're sympathetic to agencies yeah. generally. They're sympathetic yeah. to allowing agencies interpret statutes the way they want to generally. Um, I mean, so the, the, it seems like it comes down to me to the those you know Bar Roberts and, Roberts and, and Barrett. Barrett yeah and Roberts and Barrett to this point they both were on the majority in Bruin mm -hmm. right um, so if you're looking at it from a Second Amendment standpoint you'd think they'd favor a program litigant maybe uh, obviously like us like we've established this isn't a Second Amendment case although you seem to. Well, Definitely I mean, think it, it, affects, it affects guns and it affects yeah. the availability of guns. And, and then the other aspect right. is uh, how have they performed on these administrative cases so far? Well, Haven't they also been skeptical, both of them, of, of government uh, expansion of power? Generally, um, hmm. you know, we, we're waiting on the Chevron case, right? So the Chevron case is, which I think, you know, um, there's a footnote in the Fifth Circuit saying, hey, Chevron wasn't raised here. But, you know, the Chevron case, or the Chevron doctrine says um, and if statute's clear, obviously you apply the statute, but if it's ambiguous, um, and, and a, certainly in the context of an, ag an agency issuing a regulation, that um, the agency is presumed to have the authority to resolve the ambiguity in the statute and that courts should defer to that. Now, there's a whole bunch of footnotes I could add and clarifications and so on. Um, the court has been asked to overturn that, um, unclear whether they're going to overturn it or simply modify it. But there, but there is this background rule that is at least still technically on the books that says where a statute is ambiguous, courts are going to defer to an agency's reasonable interpretation. Um, Roberts has shown some skepticism of that rule, at least in its broadest application. Um, on the other hand, we, we tend to think Roberts is concerned about the public perception of the court. So, uh, and is that fair or not, you know? I don't know, but there's certainly that is a widespread view, and there's certainly a lot of ever since the uh, Obamacare case, yeah, right? right? And there are a lot, and things he said, and so on, and other cases. Yeah. And um, Justice Barrett, you know, we don't know as much because she hasn't been on the court for as long, but she certainly joined plenty of opinions that um, show are, are skeptical of aggressive efforts by agencies to to assert more authority, and um, you know, has written some opinions about how we think about. What is to me at least the 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 underlying question here, which is how much authority did Congress give the agencies? Um, in this case, um, you know, I think there are parts of this case that are close, and and I think it actually combines two issues that I can at least make the argument cut in different directions. Um, that is to say, if you go to the statute, um, the statute seems to anticipate more flexibility with regard to how you define a firearm than to how you define a frame or receiver. Um, I think that's probably why the Fifth Circuit opinion starts with frame or receiver. Um, and 
Um, when you add to that um, uh, the kind of the authority the agency clearly has to implement the statute, you can imagine a justice who is generally skeptical of really broad assertions of agency authority saying a rule that does no more than apply a, or interpret a or apply or enforce a, 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 a broad statutory provision with what we might characterize as an anti-circumvention rule is different from the agency simply you know, just roping in things that 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 it had never roped in before. That is to say, I could see a justice who is skeptical of um, the government's position in the bump stock case, at least with regard to the firearm definition, thinking the ATF is is, is okay here. Um, mm. um, That's I think it's harder for frame or receiver, um, but that that also starts to get into the weeds. And the question is how much do the justices want to get into those weeds? Uh, which, yeah. Well, so when you say that, uh, I mean, the regulated part in the statute is the frame or receiver, right? Well, so um, the, the, the act defines firearm to include any weapon, which will, or, you know, or is designed to, or may readily be converted to expel a projectile by the action of an, right. So, so and that, that, mm -hmm. that language, um, um, yeah, so I, I think that, that that language means that that insofar as the regulation um, apply expand or applied that definition to weapons part kits that that is designed or may readily be completed, assembled, restored, or otherwise converted to expel a projectile by the action of an explosive. I think the government's on on you know comes into court with a stronger argument there than it does where uh, with the regulation um, that seeks to kind of apply an equivalently broad definition to frame or receiver in part right. because the definition in the statute of frame or receiver it doesn't have this ready readily converted language or it doesn't have yeah this that was the that, basic holding at the lower court right that the essentially the atf is trying to add the uh, readily converted to language to frame and receiver when it's not actually in the statute that right way. so as a textual the matter and again that, the fifth circuit yeah. led with that in its lower court opinion and i think i think as a textual matter the government has a harder time there, right? Because you would there, there are a bunch of arguments you would make. One of which is Congress knew how to include an anti-circumvention principle, right? Congress knew how to say if it's covered when it's assembled, you can't readily disassemble it and have it suddenly not covered. If you're right. if, if you're the if you're the the seller, um, and and you know you're you're selling all the pieces, um, Congress did that for firearm, arguably. Uh, and again, there's this debate about what what readily be what readily converted means um right. it didn't do it with um frame or receiver and um that difference matters right so we kind of assume that if congress adopt in the same statutory scheme adopts broader flex and flex, broader and more flexible language in one part and not in the other we generally assume congress did that for a reason and and there were you know there was some rationality right congress was not trying to say anything that could ever be used as part of a gun um is it counts as a gun or counts even as a frame or receiver but congress did seem to say that when you have all the parts or or at least the government can make this argument again i'm not saying the government necessarily wins on this but it's a it's a stronger argument and as academics we kind of say you know we like to play around with these gray areas um, Congress did at least arguably say that with the assembled firearm or all of the parts that are together that could read readily be reassembled. Right. Or you can't sell somebody all of the parts they need already finished to just put a gun together and claim it's not a gun. That's sort of, uh, I guess, at least what the lower court was interpreting that part of the, the law to mean. Right. But, and, but, and, and my view is just that, 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 that you know, if, if unless one is going to say that um, uh, uh, that uh, that the phrase you know any weapon which will or is designed to or readily uh, or or may readily be converted to expel a projectile, et cetera, et cetera, unless one is going to say that la that language is fully determinate and there is no ambiguity in, in it whatsoever about where one. Um, you know, draws the line between what is covered and what is not. It, the government seems to have a fairly strong argument about the the full about the firearm as a whole. 
the lack of, and that the lack of such language with regard to firearm receiver kind of simultaneously strengthens the argument with regard to all the parts, weakens the argument with regard to firearm or receiver to a, a frame or receiver. I, I think that's that's and and um, so it would not surprise me at all. Again, not having read merits briefs because they haven't been filed, not having um, heard oral argument, um, it wouldn't just from what from what we know now, it wouldn't surprise me if one or two justices think that. Diff, you know, the two parts don't necessarily rise and fall together. Yeah, well, do you, so let me ask you this. Yeah. Uh, do you think this is what the oral arguments in this case are going to be, what we're just going back and forth here on basically these? I think so. Specific, I, just like because that's what the bump stock yeah. case seemed to come down to yeah. is just arguing over what exactly the statute means. Less so because uh, the other half of this is the way that the ATF has reinterpreted things that they used to th say something completely different than what they say now. Uh, right, which was, was a more major of an point, issue, which was but more, doesn't really come up in the oral arguments in the bump stock case. Well, although although I mean, it came up a little bit. I mean, but everyone knows that 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 the weird thing about the ATF uh, position in the bump stock case is the right. ATF not wanting to rely on the Chevron doctrine, which I mentioned. Um, um, in part because the Trump administration didn't want to rely on it and there and, you know, was happy with the idea that it might be overturned um, and kind of prudentially agencies have been trying to rely upon it less, especially in the Supreme Court. You know, ATF said that the statutes always meant this. Um, right. we're, so we're not in, uh, we're not asking for Chevron deference and we're not reinterpreting it. It just always meant this. We just never knew it, which. I yeah. I have a lot of problems with that. Um, you know, in any I thought context. that would come up a lot more in oral arguments. Well, than it yeah, did. Um, um, uh, and it's but, a similar thing here, where yeah. this this rule that they're reinterpreting comes from you know the the sixties, where yeah, now so, suddenly it means something else. Yeah, although it's interesting here is at least again with and and you probably understand and know some of this history better than I do, but but as I understand the way the ATF has at least interpreted the firearm definition historically that um that it has historically adopted kind of an anti-circumvention gloss on on that language historically um and um there are arguments and again i think the chevron decision matters i mean the the chevron decision the the, the this low bright, bright and relentless case that the court will decide sometime between now and july that decision will affect how this case is briefed. And the government is not going to want to brief this case until it sees that decision. Because an alternative to Chevron, there is an alternative to Chevron, which says, it's called Skidmore, um, which says you don't defer to the agency, but you recognize that the agency has expertise, that the agency um, implements this statute, that the agency might have even played a role in advising Congress about how to write the statute. And that if an agency has interpreted a statute in a very consistent way, especially if it did so beginning at relevant periods, that we place a lot of weight on that. And so if, in fact, the ATF can, in, can establish that it has always viewed this language about something that is designed or read, that can readily may readily be converted as the, an anti as anti circumvention language, right, to avoid someone from being able to uh, not have to have a, a license or not have to do background checks or whatever else um, by disassembling um, of firearms, but essentially selling all the relevant pieces to people that they expect can assemble, then the ATF saying we're just updating that would be on stronger ground than if the ATF could not make that case. Uh, and it wouldn't be that the ATF automatically wins, but rather the idea being that the ATF having adopted this general approach to the to the statute for an extended period of time both um is itself evidence of what everyone understood the statute to mean um as well as is perhaps um you know entitled to some degree of weight because it you know congress has never gotten around to, to correcting them and everyone who's subject to the rule is kind of aware of it and is on notice of it um, yeah, I don't and, think that's the case here, though. Well, um, it's, they make the argument again. Right. I know they made the, the argument. I know the, the real, Fifth Circuit said mm -hmm. no. You know, if 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 it's if it's a bad interpretation, it's always been a bad interpretation. My point is is that there are um, strands within administrative law doctrine 
that yeah. the, that might be strengthened if the court overturns Chevron, which would actually give those arguments more weight. Again, I'm, I'm assuming, for the sake of argument, that the ATF can actually, you know, sh- provide the evidence of that claim. Um, right. The Fifth Circuit yeah, it's said kind of, it doesn't matter. It's and, sort of ironic in this case because, like, all the focus is on the, you know, the ghost gun stuff and the home-built firearms and, and uh, you know, that that sort of aspect of it because that's that's what the president emphasizes and that's what gets headlines right. or whatever. But the ATF, if you really read this um, this rule. They're honestly much more focused on the concept of uh, <laughs> redefining what a frame and receiver is from how they had originally defined those terms, because not not so much because of these, uh, you know, uh, buy, build, shoot kits or, or polymer 80 lowers or, or whatever, uh, 80% AR lowers. It's because of the way that they um, have been essentially... Um, Missing, misenforcing their own rule for like 50, 60 years, because when they originally defined frame and receiver, especially receiver, they said it had to contain a number of uh, of parts, uh, including like the breech of the gun, the trigger control group. They all had to be in one piece for it to be a receiver. And that, they did the, it was, honestly, it's just sort of uh, seems like bureaucratic incompetence from the ATF and then they just ignored their own rule and because uh, I can like I can bring one right here right I have a uh, for anyone listening and not watching this is a and, and I'm holding an AR-15 um, fully complete lower receiver and uh, if you you'll notice that um, if you buy one of these or if you look at mine it has a serial number engraved into it because this is the part that the ATF classifies as the receiver for an AR-15. The problem is that this part does not include all of those components that the ATF's old rule said it has to. And so they've just been doing that for decades. And it hadn't become a problem until relatively recently when federal judges started to notice that this part does not actually fit the ATF's own definition for what a receiver is. And the ATF is just kind of and the industry has gone along with this uh, this issue. And so a lot of the, I, like it gets a lot of headlines, the other aspect of this, but really it's kind of about trying to fix fix the, some of these screw-ups, um, which, yeah. is, which is funny because this gun existed at the time. Like well, split well, receiver, there's an upper receiver part to an AR-15. Yeah. It comes in two pieces. And so like the, the breach of the AR-15 is in the upper receiver, not the, the lower receiver. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of, um, well, interesting I, I because think that's, the that's more vulnerable more part of the, the core rule. of this. Yeah. I yeah. think that's the more vulnerable part because I think, I think you're absolutely right that, you know, the, the frame or receiver part of the statute is written, um, more specifically or kind of with greater specificity. It doesn't have yeah. that, that what I, what I, what I'm referring to is kind of the anti-circumvention language, right? So the way to think about it is Congress sometimes says, look, we're not the experts, this is what we're trying to reach, but we're going to we're going to write our language in a way so that if we don't nail it perfectly, the agency is going to be able to get what mm. it needs to get at. It arguably did that with the firearm definition. It did mm. not do that with the, the frame or receiver definition. And I think it's also fair to say that historically, the ATF was not known as an agency that really sweated the details of administrative law. Um, <laughs> it was a, not alone. That's a good way of putting um, it. The yeah. IRS... Um, until rel- until very recently, that complaint was long made of the IRS. I think with I think fairly, it's a complaint made about um, you know, immigration law. Uh, it is it, it is it. There are some agencies that are very good at administrative law, that are very good at dotting every i, crossing every t, updating things the way they need to, going to Congress and saying, "Hey, we need help when when they don't have the authority they need." And there are some agencies that are kind of like, eh, you know, no one's going to complain. We're going to win. Leave you know. Um, we're, you know, we're, we're not worried about it. Courts aren't, aren't, aren't getting on us or the leverage we have over those we right. regulate as such. And the ATF has arguably been in that latter category. And I think the industry has been fine with this yeah. particular compromise or, you know, well, screw and, up and the law if you're, for a while. If you're, if you're a large a established manufacturer, solution. if you're a large established manufacturer that has to deal with the ATF on a regular basis and doesn't want to be hassled and it's not going to affect your bottom line why are you worried about it, right? If you're a small yeah. manufacturer um, where the, the compliance burdens are greater, 
um, where you see an opportunity for competitive advantage or just because, you know, you're a, you're not some big corporation, you're a small, you know, small entity that's in the business for, for other reasons, right? Reasons of principle, not just, uh, you might be more inclined to challenge and that we see that happen too, right? In a lot of regulatory contexts, the larger players are like, just tell me what the rule is. I'll live with the rule within reason. Um, mm -hmm. I want right. certainty. I want the chance. I want the ability to invest in compliance. Uh, and that's when a lot lawyer. of this rule yeah. is just kind of trying to uh, update the language to fit what they were already doing. Like uh, they're not planning according to the ATF, at least. And, yeah. you know, uh, well, here's a quick take question. them with their take them at their word, I guess, is what they're trying well, here's to Here's a question people, for you, right? I mean, they just want this to be they just want to keep things the same. They want to keep doing this. Uh, so they're, they've tried to update their language so that it's actually fits with what they're currently doing. And I would assume that larger manufacturers, insofar as smaller manufacturers aren't complying or weren't complying, might be really happy with the idea of make the little guy do the same thing that we do. Um, well, it wasn't, it's not that anyone wasn't doing this. The problem was that people were being arrested for having just a lower receiver and uh, you know, for being a prohibited person, being a felon in possession and just having these lower receivers and the problem, they'd be charged for that. And then when it got to court, uh, you had a couple of judges who were like, wait a second, this doesn't fit the definition that you have. What this person is possessing doesn't fit the, your definition of a receiver. So these charges can't stand. And that created a uh, real problems for the ATF and DOJ in court. And that's honestly, I think that's the main that's Goal interesting because that the government's portray. Role. I mean, certainly the, the way the government portrays the issue to the Supreme Court in its cert petition is that this is primarily about um, uh, mm -hmm. sale. Um, and um, uh, and they've kind of they've kind of pushed the boundaries on what they were originally saying about the sort of 80 percent stuff. OK, because they were still claiming that um, that it was really just about the kits and selling it as part of this kit, that there was the problem, not the lower the eighty percent lowers themselves, but selling it with a jig and with other parts—that was their their issue, and that's where it becomes a, a firearm. The collection of parts, even if the even if the included eighty percent receiver is doesn't meet the definition of a receiver, but they've they've kind of tried to expand upon that since they put out the rule too. So it's I yeah, know, I mean they've, it's they've it's kind of went out on a limb on some of these things. Yeah, I mean I suspect too, you know, for issues, you know, you know. What often comes up in a lot of these cases is think arguments about things like the rule of lenity and and mm. and the like. And for those sorts of reasons, or to or to try to avoid those sorts of problems, it makes sense for the government to emphasize, um, uh, uh, you know, it 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 makes sense that they would emphasize that this is about gun sales. Um, um, yeah, I mean, their their line is all about. Right. You people can sell 80% lowers without having to get it. They can make them and sell them without having to get any licenses or doing background checks on the people who are buying them. And, and, uh, and also they don't have to include serial numbers. That's why they call them ghost guns. Right. You can't trace the serial number, um, you know, so forth. But, but, uh, yeah, you look at the rule closely and look at the, what the recent history of some of the issues the ATF and DOJ have run into with prosecutions, you start to see what they're, the bulk of this rule is really about, um, and and then the other half of it is a little bit more of a political fight uh, sure. in line with the president's you know agenda on these these sorts of questions. But but it'll be interesting to see what the Supreme Court does with it. I think yeah. you're you know you've laid out a pretty pretty compelling case of why this uh, is not necessarily a slam dunk for the plaintiffs here. Um, and and it'll be face the phrase "ghost guns" here. I mean, you know, the the. You'd always rather go into court with the kind of the, the broader facts and narrative being, you know, making people sympathetic to your side. And, sure, sure. Um, folks that aren't aware of the long history of people gunsmithing and making parts and assembling guns. And I mean, mm -hmm. you know, which has been legal our entire, our um, entire history. Right. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, I think as a technical matter, it, 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 it doesn't, um, you know, the fact that it's relating to the re to the rule, the fact that that you have at least some at least for parts of it uh, language where there's at least a plausible argument for the government. Mm. Again, there I'm assuming that that some of what the government says it can show it can show. Um, yeah. yeah. And to be fair, the definition of what a receiver and frame isn't in the statute. 
right? You have these uh, ter the, this terminology around it, like readily converted to that might that isn't next to frames and receivers, but it doesn't say what a frame and receiver is in the statute. That comes from all from ATF rulemaking. Right, but they, and they say the a frame place. or receiver is a frame or receiver or something that, I mean, right. I'm, I'm paraphrasing, or something that can be a frame or receiver or can become a frame or receiver. Or, yeah, that's where they're trying to, yeah. the ATF is trying to add that into that section, but really they have a lot of discretion over what is a frame or receiver because it's not actually defined in the statute. That's another area where maybe they have some additional leeway there maybe the justices will see that i don't know yeah. it'll be it'll be really interesting but we really appreciate you taking uh the time to to give us your view on this um i think uh perhaps we have to have you back on maybe after oral arguments happen so sure. we can get some more of your insight because yeah. i think we, this should uh, be heard in october really um we assume it will i mean we don't know for sure um usually the court schedules cases in in line with when they were granted and um you know the initial the initial sitting you know is usually you know 8 10 12 cases um uh this sitting will uh, usually usually sittings are 8 or 10 cases there are only four granted for next term so presumably mm -hmm. this will be heard in october the, the court isn't obligated to do that um but we assume it will, it will be heard in october wonderful well hopefully we can have you back on at that point in the meantime i'm sure you'll be writing about these things and lots of other uh, well, fascinating stories that involve guns and, and ministry of law or the second amendment or what have you, uh, if people want to follow your work, where can they do that? So, um, on Twitter, I'm at, at Jay Adler one nine six nine or X or whatever I'm supposed to call it. Um, uh, most of my writing is either directly on the Vala conspiracy blog, or I link to it there. Um, and that that's at reason.com. Um, if you go there, there is a, but uh, on, a, on the banner, it says Volok, V-O-L-O-K-H. You can click on that or, you know, reason.com slash Volok, V-O-L-O-K-H. Um, and I'm one of the contributors there. And uh, I think under the Who We Are tab, you can look at just my stuff. But my my co-bloggers write lots of good stuff, too. So I, I wouldn't want to discourage wonderful. folks from reading them as well. All right. Wonderful. Well, that's all the time we've got this week. Uh, thank you guys for tuning in and listening. If you are interested in taking advantage of our uh, sale, you can head over to reload.com and pick up a membership today, 20% off your first year. It's a good deal. We don't do sales very often. So I encourage you to take advantage of that while you can. Um, and of course, if not ready to commit to a, a membership yet, you can always sign up for our free weekly newsletter, which goes out every Friday morning and keeps you up to date with what's going on with guns in America. That's all we've got for you this week. We will see you guys again real soon.